in the previous study, we saw that the disciples wanted glory without the cross. They wanted joy without pain. In the words of Bonhoeffer, they wanted discipleship without cost. And now Jesus makes perfectly clear that that is just not on the table. He says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, they must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Now these days we use the phrase bearing a cross to mean just something that's difficult. Like a woman might say, my difficult husband is the cross that I have to bear. Now I'm sorry for her and her difficult husband, but that's just not what Jesus meant. In those days, if you saw someone being led down the road with a cross on his back, it meant just one thing. They were about to be put to death. The cross was a death-dealing instrument and nothing else. If we're to be disciples of Jesus, self has to be put to death. And Jesus shows us that it's tremendously important. If we don't, he says, we could lose our own soul. And perhaps even worse, at that last day, he will be ashamed of us. Imagine Jesus being ashamed of us. I can still hear the voice of my favorite preacher from my youth, Bernard Johansson, booming out. It's a shame to live the self-life in the family of God. I don't want Jesus ashamed of me. Self has to die. And it's a very difficult thing, otherwise more people would do it. So how do we do it? When Wendy and I were engaged, we agreed each to take the other's wedding ring and inscribe on it a reference to a passage of scripture for our marriage. I think I can still get my ring off. And now you can see what she inscribed in my ring. I think she chose the best passage in the whole Bible for marriage. Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 to 18. Whenever couples came to me to be married, I used to spend two or three sessions with them talking about marriage. And at some point I would always say to them, I want to introduce to you a simple, secret, foolproof formula for marriage. And then I would point them to the fourth verse of Wendy's passage. Let each put the interest of the other before their own. You can't ask for a better description of denying yourself and taking up your cross. Notice that it doesn't say we have to suppress our own interests and needs completely. That would just lead us to be doormats or victims or very needy people. Nothing's achieved by that. But to put our interests after the interests of the other. If every couple would do that, there would be no divorces. If every church member would do that, there would be no church splits. The selfishness within us has to die. Now, how do we do that? Now, there are some people for whom it seems to come quite easily. They are the caregivers of this world, and we give thanks for them. Perhaps the sweetest example of that I know is from what I consider to be the greatest classical movie of all time, Gone with the Wind. Miss Melly was always putting the needs of others before her own. Here we see her, with great compassion, trying to console Rhett Butler in the death of his daughter. And so a very few people seem to find it relatively easy to put the needs of others above their own. But for the vast majority of us, it's incredibly difficult to root out that streak of selfishness within us. So I'm going to suggest three ways. The first is that we literally put into practice steps four to seven of Alcoholics Anonymous 12 Steps Plan. Make a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Admit to God, to ourselves and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Be entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character and humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. The period of Lent is specifically set aside to making a fearless, searching moral inventory of ourselves, particularly comparing ourselves to the life of Christ. And that is really why I've done this series in Mark. The second is that I think it's very helpful to develop a habit of allowing our trials and tribulations, big or small, from a series of annoying red robots to something really serious, to allow our trials to cleanse us and particularly to purify us from selfishness. Now I'm not saying that God sends trials. I think most of our sorrow arises simply from living in this hurting, fallen world. But if we allow our pain to burn away a little dross and produce a little gold, then at least we won't have wasted our sorrow. But the third and most important, I think, is the use of sheer old-fashioned willpower. Jesus said, deny yourself, 
take up your cross, follow me. Those are actually commands. I have to do them by decision, and by His grace, I keep them by my willpower. Now, I say old-fashioned willpower simply because the West at the moment is very flabby and weak-willed. But we must never underestimate the power of the human will. In the 1930s, the democracies were also very weak and morally flabby, and they allowed Hitler to get to power when with a little backbone they could have stopped him. But then in 1940, from Westminster, there came a voice, and it said this, Let us, therefore, brace ourselves to our duties. And the world was amazed at what the power of the human will could accomplish. And so let us brace ourselves to do our duty. Let us use every ounce of our willpower to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow him.